Hello and welcome to another installment of God's Roadmap to the End. Firstly, I would like to apologize for the radio silence over the past three months, which may have given the impression to some that I have given up on watching for the return of the Lord, or that I have hidden in shame for not being correct about the Revelation 12 signs interpretation. I can assure you that this is definitely not the case. At times, we just have to be silent and wait on the Lord to see what He reveals to us next, or what He wants us to do next, and He has certainly shown us a lot more since September the 23rd. We will get into the specifics shortly. I would also like to wish you all a very blessed and happy new year for 2018. Even though we are still here and many of us have been disappointed by the fact that we had to wait a little longer, our Heavenly Father has given us a little more time to reach out to the lost in the wake of many prophecies being fulfilled before our eyes, especially when we focus our attention on Israel. That is also why I would like to kick off with a new video for 2018, not only to encourage those who have given up hope, or who are ready to give up hope, but also to provide some perspective for those who may feel that the information in the videos provided previously is wrong or useless. The videos I made in 2016 and 2017 contain valuable information in my opinion, which our Heavenly Father allowed me understanding of in order to grasp certain concepts that were previously hidden to us. The information and concepts conveyed in these videos are still very valid even though the time frame that apply to them may have to be adjusted to incorporate the delay that we are experiencing. Please keep this in mind if you decide to watch any of the earlier videos again or for the first time. So what do we make of the Revelation 12 sign that was fulfilled on September 23rd of 2017? When we consider this incredible heavenly sign that had been designed and planned at the creation of the universe, we have to keep in mind that we are limited in our abilities to perceive and to understand perfectly, and our Heavenly Father made it clear in His Word that our thoughts and ways are not His. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As such, we should expect to fail in our understanding, and when we do, we only confirm that God's word is true, but, and this is very important to take note of in my opinion, it is by far more important to be watching and to be ready for the return of the Lord than to be right about the actual date on which he will gather us unto him. My goal is always to look for the earliest possible time at which our departure from the earth can occur, and to be ready for it, and to share that possibility with you, so that you can also be ready, should it be the appointed time. If nothing happens, then we were at least ready and found watching, even though nothing happened, and then I look for the next opportunity with a high probability. I look for events occurring in the world that would seem to line up with biblical prophecy and I share with you what I find and what I believe our Heavenly Father reveals to us in order to give us understanding. As such I would like to apologize to those of you who feel that you have been disappointed or have been misled by my imperfections and the information provided in previous videos regarding our possible departure on September the 23rd. I am not God, and I am not a prophet, and as such I do not know everything. I can only do my best to interpret possible outcomes based on my understanding of the Bible, and how what was prophesied could possibly relate to events occurring around us in the world today. The Bible clearly tells us that our understanding, while we exist in our fallen state, will never be perfect or complete. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Looking back at the Revelation 12 sign, there was very good support for having the rapture occurring on September the 23rd. As we had a pattern that repeated perfectly between Jesus' crucifixion, that occurred on the first feast day of the spring season, 
which was also marked by a very unique heavenly sign and the Revelation 12 sign following the same pattern in falling on the first fall feast and marking the possible fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets with a very unique heavenly sign. However, now that we have gone past this date and know that this was not our Heavenly Father's intention to remove us from the earth on this day, we understand the purpose of this sign much better. Let me give an analogy. It is similar to a person receiving a piece of paper from someone who wrote a flight number and a date and time on it. If no other information is given, this person may think that this would point to the date and time of a passenger flight's departure. But when the date and time arrives, he finds out that the date and time is in fact a setting on his alarm clock that woke him up in order for him to make the flight in time. He then has to get out of bed, get ready to travel, take his luggage, travel to the airport, check in, wait at the boarding gate for a while to board the plane, get into the plane, taxi to the runway, and only then depart for a new destination. There is therefore some time that follows the person being woken by his alarm clock and taking off in the airplane. I believe in hindsight that the Revelation 12 sign has a similar application to the situation in which this person's alarm clock went off. It was meant to wake us up in order for us to prepare ourselves and to be ready to board the ark that the Lord had prepared for us. And until we find ourselves there, time continues to run out and more and more people seem to be giving up on the hope which they had last year in September. It is part of a sequence of events that started with the heavenly sign given to us on September 23rd and ending in the rescue and removal of the church from earth, all forming part of the events described in Revelation 12 and being fulfilled before our eyes, even while many would think it is not so. We are only able to realize this in hindsight, and when we do, we find that we now have more information to go on to prepare for what lies ahead of us than we did when the Revelation 12 sign was about to be fulfilled. While I was waiting for our blessed hope on September the 23rd, I heard a voice in my spirit saying, Not yet, Yaku. The time is not yet. As a result, I was not really surprised when nothing happened, even though I was a little disappointed. At that point, I did not have complete peace in my spirit or complete assurance that all the aspects touched on in God's word that are associated with this day had been met in the world around us. Specific aspects that were missing for me was a reason for the overnight destruction of Damascus, which is described to us in Isaiah 17, and some event during which a proclamation of peace and security would be made, which would result in this destruction that would follow, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3. Since September 23rd, a lot has happened and many additional pieces of the puzzle have fallen into place giving us additional insight into what we could expect to happen in the world and how this relate to our blessed hope. We are seeing the world talking about peace and security a lot. And this was not only the theme of 2017 at the United Nations, but they also discussed peace and security in the world on December 20th and 21st of 2017. This is what 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3 tells us, will be the situation when great destruction occurs and when some will escape while others will not. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Also note how this event is tied to the women in travail, which would tell us that the events that are described here are associated with the Revelation 12 sign's fulfillment, even though the events described in Revelation 12 are fulfilled progressively. This is very important to keep in mind, as it means that the Feast of Trumpets may have been fulfilled on September 23rd, even though it would seem that nothing happened. Just like the alarm clock going off in the analogy earlier would be a far cry from the departure of the airplane sometime later, it set in motion events that ended in the departure of a flight and was an essential part of the process. 
Peace and security have now become quite a prominent theme in the world, and for all intents and purposes, the sudden destruction is all that remains to occur in this respect. We have also seen the tension between various nations increasing significantly since September of 2017. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The US and North Korea are moving ever closer to what would seem to be a full-on nuclear war. This is just waiting for one of the two rulers of these countries to press the button on the desk they claim to have in their offices and for a large-scale annihilation to follow. This situation has also pulled other nations into this conflict, with illegal oil transfers happening between some of these nations and North Korea at sea, and increasing the tension between them and the US as they are violating the UN's resolution regarding sanctions against North Korea. If we shift our focus to the Middle East, we find even more exciting events coming to pass that are fulfilling prophecy, in my opinion, and it is here where I believe we should keep our eyes focused to discover a better time frame of our blessed hope. On December 6th, Donald Trump declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel, which by the way is a proven fact from biblical and historical sources, but most of the world would prefer to deny this fact. What we are seeing happening here is very likely the fulfillment of Zechariah 12, in which Jerusalem is made a burdensome stone that will cut to pieces all who burden them with the city. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Note something important from this passage, how Jerusalem receives this property that is assigned to it when it is besieged. Keep this aspect in mind when we consider a passage from Isaiah 21 shortly. Looking at the situation before us today, Donald Trump would seem to fulfill the same role that King Cyrus of Persia fulfilled during Israel's time in Babylon, which occurred after they had been kept from possessing Jerusalem for 70 years. The Word of God explains to us the following that happened during the rule of King Cyrus. That saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Now, from our experience surrounding the Revelation 12 sign, we know that God very often works with patterns that repeat, but that he may also choose not to apply a specific pattern to a situation that would seem to follow a very solid pattern. So please keep this in mind when we compare King Cyrus of Persia to President Trump. We will only know for sure when we have hindsight in our favor. Hypothetically then, Donald Trump has already made a declaration concerning Jerusalem, which at this point, just as in Cyrus's case, had been kept from Israel for a period of 70 years, since they moved back to their land, and this move by Trump has angered many nations in the world. Trump is also a Gentile king that has been making these declarations in the first year of his presidency, once again just as King Cyrus. However, from what we see in the passage above, and for the pattern to repeat accurately, Donald Trump should then be expected to also make a declaration regarding the rebuilding of the third temple in Jerusalem, if the pattern is indeed a match. Before we look at this in a little more detail, I would just like to touch on some other passages from Isaiah that I find clearly associated and related to the events currently playing out and with a description of the rapture in Isaiah as well, and a very clear reference to Trump being involved 
which I believe our Heavenly Father allowed me to realize as I was working on the script for this video. These are explained in the following passages. The Burden of Damascus Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And in that day it shall come to pass, that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. And it shall be as when the harvestman gathereth the corn, and reapeth the ears with his arm, and it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Rephaim. Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it, as the shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bough, four or five in the outmost fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord God of Israel. In the first passage we see Damascus being described as becoming a ruinous heap, and that this is associated with Jacob waxing thin, which could point to the possible start of Jacob's trouble. It also mentions a harvest event, for which I have given an overview in the Rapture Part 2 video regarding our understanding of the first resurrection, and how this harvest event in Isaiah would point us to God's main harvest of his field of people who have faith in Jesus as their Savior, leaving the gleanings of his field to the poor to harvest. When we look at images of Damascus today, it is clearly already somewhat of a ruinous heap. But in the second passage, we are also given some information regarding the rushing of nations which are associated with the destruction that is described, occurring over a very short period of time. This would still seem to be missing from the situation that we see in Syria today. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And behold, at eventide trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us, and the lot of them that rob us. It is also interesting to note from this passage that this destruction starts with trouble in the evening, and in the morning that follows, Damascus is described as not existing anymore. So even though Damascus already seems like a ruinous heap, it would also seem to be associated with the rushing of many nations that would find them there at the time when this will occur. This would then also seem to be associated with Zechariah 12, in which Jerusalem would have become a burdensome stone to the nation surrounding it, and that those who burden themselves with it will be cut in pieces and become as chaff before the wind as described in Isaiah 17. There are therefore, in my opinion, definitely correlations between what we see happening in the world regarding Jerusalem and prophesied events that may be related to the situation we now see developing in the Middle East. Having received the beginning of understanding regarding these prophecies, we now have a better idea of what to look for and what to expect in the future. Let us look at the next passage. A grievous vision is declared unto me. The treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media, all the signs thereof have I made to cease. Therefore are my loins filled with pain, Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it, I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted, fearfulness affrighted me, the night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. I am of the opinion that this vision is also related to the events described in Isaiah 17 
But in this case, it is given to us from Israel's perspective. We see an instruction given to Elam and media to besiege, which would point to Iran and its proxies moving toward Israel to besiege it at the time when the prophecies above are about to be fulfilled. This aspect would then clearly tie Isaiah 21 to Zechariah 12 that we looked at earlier, telling us that Jerusalem becomes a cup of trembling when specifically Iran and its proxies gather around it for a siege. This would also be the time at which the great destruction spoken of in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3 will occur when peace and safety is mentioned, which would also be tied to Isaiah 21 as part of the events described in this passage. We also see the mention of a treacherous dealer that deals treacherously, and he is also a spoiler that spoils. In the situation that we find ourselves in today, where this prophecy could soon be fulfilled, who would be considered a treacherous dealer who would have the power to make the deals involving Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the Third Temple? I think it is clear that there is one person who has already begun to show us his capacity for taking on this role, and this is President Trump. Interestingly enough, he is also the person who wrote The Art of the Deal, making him a prime candidate for being the dealer that is described in this passage. Quoting Trump commenting on his book The Art of the Deal, The Art of the Deal is an unguarded look at the mind of a brilliant entrepreneur and an unprecedented education in the practice of deal-making. Do you not think that our Heavenly Father purposefully refers to Trump as a dealer in Isaiah 21 in order for us to be able to identify and to associate him with this prophecy? Trump is also handling the situation between Israel and the Palestinians like one would handle a business deal, forcing a desired outcome by threatening to cut funding from parties who are unwilling to enter into the deal and doing so forcing them into the deal. This dealer is also described as treacherous, which is just as interesting as I got an email pointing out the following article as I was writing the script for this video. The article would seem to confirm Trump's treachery or deception with which he operates even though most of this may be obscured from the public's view. I believe the Lord wants us to know who the actors will be that we have to keep our eyes on when we watch for events in the world that will point us to our escape. From the Palestinians' perspective, President Trump would also be considered the spoiler that spoils, given the fact that he has now taken Jerusalem, quote, off the table, unquote, and have spoiled any future peace deals that could theoretically be entered into by any Muslim nation or group since they regard Jerusalem as the third holiest site, even though it is never mentioned in the Qur'an. With Jerusalem no longer available as a bargaining chip for peace, any deal that is struck between Israel and those of the Muslim faith should be considered highly suspect, in my opinion, even if the parties entering into this deal would somehow seem to agree to the terms. From a Muslim perspective, such a move would show submission to their enemy, which is something they would never agree to do, even if it seems to be the case on the surface. Keeping this in mind, and coming back to considering how Donald Trump could be patterned after King Cyrus, we also see the following passage from Ezra regarding Cyrus's actions. In the first year of Cyrus the king, the same Cyrus the king made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be builded, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid, the height thereof threescore cubits, and the breadth thereof threescore cubits. President Trump is currently serving his first year as President of the United States which started on January 20th of 2017, and he has already made a decree regarding Jerusalem being reinstated as the capital of Israel. If he is to follow the pattern of Cyrus given to us in the word of God perfectly, he will need to make a decree regarding the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem on or before January 20th, 2018. 
This would be a crucial point on our timeline as this could, in my opinion, be a watershed moment and fulfilling many of the prophecies that we discuss today. In the passage from Isaiah 21, we see other interesting aspects which in 2016 I had a completely different understanding and interpretation of. However, given the events that have now transpired with regards to the status of Jerusalem and the temple which should shortly follow, our insight has improved and we can better understand the meaning behind what was written. Apart from the grievous vision in which treacherous dealing and spoiling is mentioned while Elam and Media or today's Iran and its proxies are instructed to besiege, we see the mention of birth pangs again and a woman in labor being described and finally the mentioning of the night of my pleasure which is turned into fear. Given the understanding that we have now received from Trump's actions regarding Jerusalem and how he seems to be following in the footsteps of King Cyrus, What would be considered Israel's pleasure? What is the one thing that Israel would consider their greatest pleasure? Would that not be the rebuilding of the third temple and having peace and security in their land? Would this be the treacherous deal that they will enter into that would lead them into Jacob's trouble? The word of God also tells us what our Heavenly Father's opinion of this deal is, that Israel will agree to enter into as can be seen in the following passage. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. From the time that it goeth forth it shall take you. For morning by morning shall it pass over, by day and by night, and it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. If President Trump follows the pattern of King Cyrus accurately, then we could possibly expect him to arrange a forced peace deal between Israel and the Palestinians, in which he will also make a decree that will allow Israel to rebuild their temple as part of this business deal, while proclaiming peace and security. Based on the information in Isaiah 21, the Muslim nations would definitely consider such a deal unacceptable and a treacherous act, and this could very likely lead to the sudden destruction which we have seen described in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3. I am however not sure if this would happen at the point where the decree to rebuild the temple is made, or whether it would only occur at the point where the foundations of the third temple are about to be laid. Both of these events could, in my opinion, serve as candidates for the fulfillment of what is known as Israel's pleasure. Whichever fulfills the prophecy, it will have an undesired outcome for Israel, where they will enter into Jacob's trouble, when Israel's birth pangs will lead to birthing wind. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child, we have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. The body of Christ, on the other hand, will be looking up, awaiting the return of our Lord and Saviour to rescue us from the situation 
that is about to unfold on the earth when Satan will be cast down to rule for a short time and to glean the corners of God's harvest of those who have faith in Jesus Christ. This could happen as soon as we see Trump moving to strike a deal between Israel and the Palestinians, which, if we consider the pattern found in King Cyrus's rule, could happen on or before January 20th. If nothing happens during Trump's first year in office, we may have to look a little further into the future to the day on which the temple's foundation would be laid in the ninth month as described in Haggai 2. Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. How does this tie in with the Revelation 12 sign, or should we forget about the sign altogether? On the contrary, there is an amazing discovery here, which may be part of our Heavenly Father's purpose, or it could be a coincidental discovery, given my lack of knowledge about the future. When the man-child is born in Revelation 12, the child, at some point, is snatched up into heaven to be rescued from the red dragon, which is ready to devour the child as soon as it is born. But we are not given any information regarding the duration between the birth of the child and the time at which it is taken out of harm's way. Searching for answers in other similar instances, we see in Jesus' case in Luke that his parents were not instructed to flee to Egypt until at least 40 days after Jesus' birth, which was the day on which he would have been taken to the temple in Jerusalem. This happened 40 days after his birth, followed by Jesus and his earthly family first returning to Nazareth and remaining there for a time before they were instructed to flee to Egypt. But we are once again not given a specific duration of how long they remained in Nazareth before they escaped to Egypt. There remains one more instance in which a man-child was born and escaped a type of a red dragon. This was Moses, who was snatched out of harm's way by his mother, who put him into a type of an ark. In Moses' case, we do get an indication of the time between being birthed and being put into the ark, which would, in turn, point to Noah being rescued from the flood that ensued after entering into the ark. The Word of God tells us that Moses was hidden for three months after his birth before he entered into the ark, as can be seen in the following passage. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. If September 23, 2017, which was three days after the new moon in September, marked the birth of the body of Christ, or the man-child, that will be snatched up out of harm's way, and we move forward to the last day on which the child could be considered three months old, we land on January 20th, 2018. This is the exact same day in which Trump would complete his first year in office. This date is exactly four lunar months from the September 23rd sign, and this just brings to mind the following two passages as well. Say not ye that there are yet four months, and then come of harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. As I said, this could only be patterns that I see coincidentally, and which our Heavenly Father may have chosen not to apply to the situation before us, 
On the other hand, if we see Trump moving to strike a deal between Israel and the Palestinians before January 20th, and we see Iran and its proxies beginning to surround Israel, it could be very possible that he may have chosen to show this information to us before it happened so that we can prepare ourselves and as we move closer to this date we will know whether this is accurate or not one way or another. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. I'm of the opinion that the situation with Jerusalem and specifically an announcement by Trump that would involve the third temple's construction are what these prophecies could be pointing to and we have been missing these aspects from our interpretation of when our blessed hope will occur. If we include these as part of the puzzle that we are trying to solve then we see how many of the other prophecies that coincide with the timing and events that are associated with the rapture of the church also coincide with events that would seem to be unfolding in the Middle East and that will lead to Israel's pleasure which will be turned unto fear for them and which could lead them into Jacob's trouble. For those who are watching these events unfold with me keep a close eye on any possible peace deal that President Trump orchestrates between Israel and the Palestinians and to a situation in which various nations, specifically Iran and its proxies, begin to gather around Israel, as these would seem to point to the fulfillment of several passages that we have discussed in this video today. If you have seen the iPetGo2 video on YouTube, I believe there is one scene that specifically refers to this event from the enemy's perspective. This is the time at which the Antichrist will be revealed to the world and it is very possible in my opinion that this event will be associated with the destruction of the armies that are gathering against Jerusalem as well as the removal of the man-child or the body of Christ from the world at the same time. This event in my opinion will also tie in with what we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where we read how the wicked will be revealed and that this would be the start of God's wrath being poured out over the world, sending the world and those that remain on earth a strong delusion to deceive them and to have them believe a lie. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not in the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We also see that the Antichrist can only be revealed once the restrainer is removed and the Bible clearly identifies a single entity on earth who is able to restrain Satan and that is the church. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. When we put all these passages together, we can begin to see how our escape from the earth will coincide with this event in which peace and security will be pronounced in Jerusalem, while a treacherous deal is being struck between Israel and others, and where a decree to rebuild the third temple could very possibly be made, all while Israel is being surrounded by many nations with the intent to destroy it. If President Trump follows the pattern of King Cyrus perfectly, it could mean that a decree to rebuild the third temple could be made on or before January 20th of 2018, and that all of these passages could be fulfilled at the same time when this is done. On the other hand, this could also point to events that may only occur later during this year, after a decree was made, and at a time when Israel is about to lay the foundations of the new temple. 
This would imply that we may need to wait a bit longer until we get closer to the end of 2018, with the date of the temple's foundation being laid prophesied to occur in the ninth month. Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. As always, I like to focus on the earliest possible fulfillment, and my current expectation in light of the passages discussed today is for January 2018. And I am also not excluding the possibility of a rapture event on the Feast of Trumpets in 2018 either. At this point we may not know the exact day on which all of these prophecies will be coming together, and for us to be in a position to recognize the day as our blessed hope. But we certainly are beginning to see now what we have to look for and what to expect as we approach this day. Remember also that Jesus said that he would return at a time that we think not, and if he comes for us in January 2018, it would certainly match the following statement, as there are very few who would be expecting him to come for us at this time. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Whatever the case may be, we certainly live in very exciting and prophetic times, and I would like to urge you to prepare for the return of the King, Jesus Christ. As time passes, we see and understand with more clarity, but what is certain is that our time here on earth is running out quickly. There is no better time than right now to make sure that you have a relationship with your Creator. Our Heavenly Father loves every one of us and is not willing that any person should perish. He has, however, given each and every person a choice to enter into a relationship with Him willingly as one would expect from a loving person. It is your choice to accept the free gift of salvation that He freely offers to every person who would accept and invite Him into their lives, to live within you through His Holy Spirit. Time is short and we could soon be attending a wedding in heaven. Will I see you there? I sincerely hope so. I'm currently running an advertisement campaign to share this information on Facebook and social media with as many people as possible before the time runs out. And if you would like to help in sending this message to more people in the little time that remains, you are welcome to contribute at the link provided in the description below. There is no obligation and I hate asking people for money, but unfortunately, it costs money to advertise, and I do not have enough to spread this on my own. One dollar shares this with about a thousand people, who may not be aware of the times that we are living in, whether they are saved or not. Every person we can reach is one more person whom our Heavenly Father may bring over our path that we have the opportunity to reach out to in love and to share with them the good news. We have a short time remaining. The harvest is ready for reaping, but the workers are few. Will you help me to prepare a little more of the harvest for our King? Thank you very much also to all who have contributed in the past year and who have assisted in reaching more than 20 million people in 2017. If you would like to keep up to date with information related to this video, please join the Signs and Seasons Facebook group below in which I often post updates on world events that have, in my opinion, prophetic significance. It is a lot quicker to put a post together than to make a video and I try to post frequently, even though I know that most people prefer to watch videos over reading a Facebook post. If you found the information in this video valuable, please will you give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already, so that you can receive updates as they become available. Please also share this with as many of your family, friends and colleagues as possible. May our Heavenly Father bless you and keep you and make His face shine upon you from now until we meet Him and each other in the air. Until next time, God bless.